Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Now I'm going to get down my knees and pray because I tell you what, there's a great message today. I don't want to hinder the work of God. I want to have enough time to finish the message. It's a message about you. And it's amazing about your life. You can listen or not listen at your call. You can daydream or not daydream. You can put your mind somewhere else and what you have to do this week. Or you can concentrate on the Word of God. When you go to the Bible and find out what the Bible says, it gives you directions on how to live life. It tells you everything. It tells you how to raise your kids, how to love your wife or husband. It tells you how to take care of your neighbors. It tells you how to do business, good, bad, indifferent. It tells you how to prosper how to live after you're prosperous, how to be successful. Everything you can ever imagine is not derived because of an education. It's derived because of an education in what God says. God created you. God created the world that you are living in. Until you and I find out what the Word of God has to say, which is the manual on how to live life, you are never going to be prosperous. So you can daydream all you want, or you can listen, but today, I promise you if you listen, you will walk out of here and go, wow, God just spoke to me today. So for the next few minutes, I want you to concentrate. I'm gonna get down on my knees and pray I need God, you need God, come stand uh, to your feet as I get down on my knees and let's pray together. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives. We have not come to hear from a man or a woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man or short man, old man or young man. We have not come to hear from a black man or white man. We have not come to hear from a brown man. We have come, Lord, to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, for his presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Welcome in our hearts now. Build us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Now, Lord, as you bless us today, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that preach and hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Thank you for Calvary chapels and harvest and Oak Valley. We thank you for the well, the way, Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, four square denomination, assemblies of God. We bless our Catholic brothers and sisters, the Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time, Lord, do we see ourselves as better than them. We see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, uh uh-uh, but yours. May all the praise and glory Go to you, Jesus' mighty name. With a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Well, as you take your seat, get your Bible, go with me to Hebrews, the 7th chapter. In Hebrews, the 7th chapter, I want to share some truths with you out of the Word of God today. And I want you to know something. This really has a lot to do with you. It's not just a history lesson in Scripture. God's not going to grade you on how much history you know or understand, but he's going to look at your life on how much of the word of God you apply to every every area of your life. And so today as we look at the word of the Lord, it's vitally important for you to give God the proper attention and respect and honor as you listen to the word of the Lord. I'm going to take you to places that you don't quite understand. In the seventh chapter of Hebrews, for us mostly Gentile believers, we probably don't have a lot of insight on what's taking place. For an example, if I mention the name Melchizedek, it doesn't mean much to anybody. But if I mention the name of Melchizedek uh, to a Jewish person who's stuck in traditions and stuck under the law, and stuck worshiping angels, and if you were the patriarchs and the prophets of old, and if you will, stuck under uh, seeing Melchizedek is vitally important, and the importance of Abraham. 
and I tried to communicate to them that Jesus Christ is better in every area than all that you're believing in, Jesus is greater. To a Jewish mind, you need to prove that to me over and over again by the scriptures. And that's what really takes place in Hebrews, the seventh chapter. But to us Gentile minds, Gentile minds, I could just make a statement to you that Jesus is better preeminent than anybody else. And you'll go, okay, fine, that's great. Let's move on to the eighth chapter. <laughs> But there's such depth in understanding of what's taking place in this existence. I want to share the title of the message, very important for you, this morning. The title of the message is really says a lot about who you are and who I am. It's called Handling the Power of Blessing. If you don't understand how to handle blessings, then when you get blessed and you don't handle it the right way, listen to what I'm going to say, listen. Listen, listen, don't expect to get blessed again. If you're blessed and you don't handle it the right way, then the blessings actually becomes a cursing and defeats your future. Let me give you an illustration. If you were to come over my house and I knew for months in advance you were coming at Christmas and I knew you loved a certain thing and I didn't know how to do it, but I saved my money. And I really worked hard to provide you a gift that would make you happy. I really found the right gift. I went out of my way. I saved the money. I got the money. I really got this great gift for you. And you came over to my house on Christmas and I gave it to you with great expectation that you would handle this blessing of a gift the right way. And you looked at it and you thought, oh, that's nice. Thank you. And you never really cared very much about it at all. In fact, when you left, I had to remind you to take the gift that I had worked so hard to give you. Let me tell you, the year afterwards, I would not be trying to get you a gift again that's going to be a great gift. Do you follow me? And oftentimes, that's the way we do when we're blessed by God because we don't handle the blessings the right way that we literally expect God to keep giving to us when he stops us and says, now it's time to grow up and learn how to handle the blessings so that you can be blessed more. Don't think you're going to get more when you haven't even handled the little. And so I'm going to read to you about three people today, very important. I'm going to read to you about the devil. I'm going to read to you about Jesus. I'm going to read to you about Abraham. The devil, Jesus, and you got to understand this, you represent Abraham. He's your father of faith. Now, in order to understand these stories out of the Old Testament I'm taking you to after we go to the New Testament, when you go to the Old Testament, they are not just stories, they're actually examples, physical examples of spiritual truth of the New Testament. So when you see a story in the Old Testament, it's making a statement about something. If you ever read the Old Testament, a lot of wars, a lot of victory, a lot of people in faith, a lot of people doing things, kind of don't quite understand how it works today, you're going to. And what the Old Testament does, it just expresses to you a spiritual truth about the New Testament. So what we're going to look at is the characters of this act, this play of your life on how to properly handle the blessings so that the blessings keep coming and are not turned off and stopped. Is that okay? In order to do that, we're going to look back at the seventh chapter of, of, of um, Hebrews, and we're going to be looking at Melchizedek once again, speaking of his greatness. Deborah, Deborah taught on it last week. It was phenomenal. Deborah taught us about Melchizedek. He is, if you will, Jesus is, uh, he, uh, Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. And as you look at his life, he had no beginning, had no end. He is eternal in his, in his uh, high priesthood. And Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. And we see that in scripture. And the point being, again, is that the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell the people who are Jewish people, this is what you're doing. You're worshiping Melchizedek when you should be worshiping Jesus. Jesus is greater than Melchizedek. Are you following me? 
So as I go through just for a few verses in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, then I'm going to take you to that same story and amplify the story and show how you play in the story out of the Old Testament. We'll be going to the book of origins. Now you want to look up, if you will, the book of origins. The book of origins, if you go to your table of contents, you'll say, Pastor, there is no book of origins. It is. It's called Genesis. And that's what the book of origins is really all about, the beginning. And we'll take you to the book of Genesis, and we'll explain the same story to you. And this time, we'll put you in there and how you respond to the blessings. If you respond the right way, you continue getting blessed. If you respond the wrong way, so oftentimes blessings are held until you learn the right way to respond to the blessings. How to handle the blessings. Are you ready? Let's take a look at Hebrews, the seventh chapter, starting in verse number six. But he who is, whose genealogy is not derived from them. Now I want to show you two words here as we take a look at it. See the word he, the word he is not capitalized, it's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about Melchizedek. And he says his genealogy is not derived from men. He was a type of Jesus, didn't come from men, came from God. Now watch this. Whose genealogy is not derived from men, from them. Notice them, the word them is those men that we're talking about. So his genealogy doesn't come in the, like yours does or mine does from men. And he says, receive tithes. Now the tithe means 10%. It means that he literally got something back from Abraham of 10%. The word tithe means a 10th part, 10th part. And here we're making a statement. He's talking about Melchizedek. He's talking about the greatness of Melchizedek. And all of a sudden he comes up with this word tithe. A lot of people don't like the word tithe. It's like a, a funny word. It's like, why do we always have to talk about money in church? Isn't tithing when you give your money? Isn't tithing when you, when you, you know, somebody bugs you about getting out your wallet and giving in your checkbook? It's, uh, what do we have to talk about tithe for? First of all, I'm not talking about, God's talking about it. And notice as he's talking about the greatness of Melchizedek, he's talking about what Melchizedek did. He received tithe from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Abraham had the promises, but he now speaks the blessings over Abraham. That's what it meant in verse number six. Now listen, follow me, verse number seven. In verse number seven, it says this. Now, beyond all contradiction, there is, here's, let me translate that for you. There is no argument about this. The lesser is blessed by the greater. Or one translation says greater, this translation says better. The lesser is blessed by the greater. In other words, that who is least gets blessed by who is greater. The lesser doesn't bless the greater. Listen to this. The greater blesses the lesser. I don't know if you got that or not. But he's coming along and he makes a statement that Melchizedek is the one who did the blessings because he was greater than Abraham. Therefore, the lesser, Abraham, who, who listen to this, gave tithe back because he was blessed to Melchizedek is the lesser. Melchizedek's the greater. Have you ever wondered why we ever bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord? We are the lesser honoring the greater who has blessed us. I want to show you that today clearly, and you'll see that, and I'll mention that numerous times. Verse number eight comes along. It's a powerful verse. It says, here mortal men receive tithes. There's that word tithes again. Now he's talking about even, not only just Melchizedek received it, but mortal men receive it. People that are made of flesh and blood. And he says, but they he who received them to whom it is witness that he lives. In other words, they receive him because the blesser, the greater God is one who is witnessing that he's alive. Verse number nine. In verse number nine, it says that even Levi, kind of a confusing thing. What's a Levi? High priest. He says these words. Even Levi receives tithes. He's talking about tithe again. 
What the heck is this all about? He goes from Melchizedek, blessing Abraham, to speaking over and over again this word that is offensive to a lot of people called tithe. Here we go again, over and over again, paid tithe through Abraham. So now he's making a statement that even the Levitical priesthood, the Levites, who came hundreds of years after Abraham, gave tithe to Melchizedek and you say, how? And I love these last three words, so to speak. How would somebody who was born hundreds of years later, who gave tithes, give it through Abraham when they weren't even around in Abraham's days? Because verse, if you will, 10, they're in the loins of Abraham, which says, makes it very clear that your children's children's children, people you don't even know, will get blessed because you are somebody who honors, listen to this, the blessing the right way. And when you honor the blessing the right way, you and your children's children's children get credit for it. That is a bizarre statement in itself. Now, in order to understand this, I wanna take you, if I may, to Genesis, the 14th chapter. Now look, here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about you, how to handle the blessings, the enemy of your life, and the one who will bless you. It's just as simple as that. We're gonna talk about your, oh, listen to this word, I'm gonna repeat it again, choices in life. We're gonna talk about your, let me repeat it, choices in life, and what it is that you have as a responsibility to the things of God. Is that okay? So I'm going to take you to Genesis 14th chapter. Let's take a look at it together. In Genesis, the 14th chapter, starting, if you will, in verse number 10, I want to introduce to you the first character in this scenario that you need to understand. Genesis 14th chapter, verse number 10. And it says, Now the valley of Sedim was full of it asphalt pits. One translation says there's a valley full of salt flats. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but have you ever seen an asphalt pit? If you've ever been down to the La Brea tar pits, that's what they are. They're actually gravel and hot tar together. What a miserable combination. And that's a tar pit. Salt flats were around them. Salt flats means nothing grows where there's salt. There's death and dead. So he makes a statement of an area, and he calls the area. He says, now in the valley of Sedim was full of asphalt pits and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me stop you right there and introduce you to the first character in understanding. The king of Sodom and Gomorrah. The king of so the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is in the Bible like Las Vegas is on steroids. As bad as you can possibly imagine, as perverted as you could possibly imagine, as demonically controlled as you can even begin to think. This is the worst city in the scriptures. This is the place where Satan himself is seated. And his name, in our particular understanding, is the king of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can just circle that if you want and put Satan off to the side. Because this is not by coincidence, this is my understanding of the scripture. So we look at this verse and he says this. Now let me read the verse. The area indicates death. The area indicates a horrible place of asphalt pits. The area itself is full of perversion and disgust. The area is contrary to the things of God, is completely, if you will, perverted in every area and full of evil. And the king over this evil is a king named Sodom and Gomorrah. Now he says, asphalt pits, king of Sodom and Gomorrah. Some fell there and remained, uh, remainder fled to the mountains. There was these kings that attacked him. These kings from other place that took on the king of Sodom and Gomorrah and all of his people. And the people died there, some did. The rest of them ran to the mountains is what he is saying. Next verse, very important for you to remember. Let me take you there, verse number 11. And they took all the goods of Sodom 
and Gomorrah and their, all of their provisions and they went their way. So when these kings came in, what did they capture? They captured the sheep, all of the values, uh, valuable items, all of the gold, all of the silver, all of the chickens, all of the goats, all of the lambs, all of the herds, all of the food, anything that had any value came in and they took that of value. Those material things, where did they take them from? Did you notice? They took them from Sodom and Gomorrah, where the king is. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want you to remember that because it's very important in your future that you understand where the material things come from. The material things now were captured by these other kings. And then they did a mistake. They captured also a man by the name of Lot, L-O-T. Lot happens to be the nephew of the brother of Abraham. And so therefore, let's go to the next verse. Watch what it says, verse 12. They also took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And when one of them escaped and came and told Abraham, verse 13, I don't even have on the overhead, I don't think is even up there. And they told Abraham and they called him the Hebrew. Just a side note for you right here. Abraham is not the first Jew. Abraham is not the first Israelite. Judah hadn't even been formulated yet. Israel hadn't even come to pass. What Abraham is, is the first Hebrew, first believer of God, the single God that spoke to him, and he follows this single God, first Hebrew. And they tell Abraham, they stole your brother's son and all of his goods. Now look what it says in verse number 14. Now when Abraham heard that his brother's son was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went and pursued as far as Dan. Listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. You need to make a note about this. It's very important. If you're going to tackle something that's impossible in your life, God better be on your side. If you're going to tackle something that's impossible in your life, God better be on your side. May I say this to you? Listen closely. I don't know if you know how crazy the verse is. Here's four kings with four professionally trained, murdering, trained soldiers. Abram, or Abraham as we know him, has 318, go back to the verse, listen to what it says. 18 trained, not soldiers, God has no problem using the word soldiers. He uses it all through the scriptures. He wants you to see that when you're facing a problem that's overwhelming, a problem that's impossible for you to win, a problem that is the odds are so against you it's ridiculous, but if you got God on your side, doesn't matter what you have if you have God. He doesn't have trained soldiers. He's got people that are brought up in his house that are trained servants. Let's talk about what a servant does. A servant delivers water. A servant fetched water. A servant cleaned the tents. A servant fed the animals. A servant watered the animals. A servant cooked the food, boiled the pots, did all the things, and made up and ready for transportation. A servant was a servant. Here are these trained servants. It is an impossibility for this man to face his problems and believe he's going to win unless he knows who his God is. And it's the same with you in your life. 
You will face impossible situations. How am I going to get out of this? How am I going to make this? How am I going to pay this? How am I going to raise these kids in these times that are so difficult? How am I going to have a marriage when there's so much coming at us? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to get a better job? How am I going to make it with inflation coming? How am I going to make it when every politician's a liar? How am I going to make it when the economy is failing? How is this going to happen? I'm here to tell you because you've got God on your side. It will come to pass and that's the point of that particular verse which is so outstanding for all of us but it doesn't stop there in verse 14 let's go to verse 15 verse 15 you see the wisdom of God applied he says in verse 15 he divided his forces against them by night and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah which is in the north of Damascus. But verse 16 takes place, and let me read verse 16 because it's so powerful, you need to understand it. Watch verse 16 for a second. So he brought back all, not some, all the goods, and also brought back his brother's lot and his goods, as well as all the women and the people. Now I want you to know what I'm going to say to you. When there is a victory, that's when the war really starts. No, wait a minute, you didn't get it. Sometimes we think because we've won something, that we won, we can coast, it's over with, put our feet up, let's go to Hawaii and let's enjoy life. We got the goods. But I'm here to tell you something, if you're a wise Christian, is when you have won a victory, that's when you need to watch out for your future. Are you following me? Because it's important for you to see something here that's vitally important. Winning is not the end. I'm speaking of the battle. Winning is only the beginning of the battle. I'll prove it to you. Here he is, stop and think about it for a moment. He's an example for us. There's things you're gonna win in life. There's areas of you're gonna achieve. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be accomplished. God's gonna do great things. He's gonna open doors that no man can open. He's gonna do marvelous and mighty things in your life. Wow, you're gonna win battles. Listen to this. You're gonna feel good about yourself, but when you win a battle, most Christians stop and coast, and that's the worst thing you could do because you're gonna be picked off because you'll find a little principle that takes place. The enemy is attracted to winners. Let me say it again. Winners attract the enemy because he knows you have let your guard down. He knows you're feeling pretty good about the blessing that you have. He knows you're now in a place where you think you can coast and that he's defeated and he's going to give up. So therefore, you used to have to fight hard, but now you've won the spoils. You don't have to fight hard anymore. See, verse 16 says he got all the goods. Verse 16, he got all the people. Verse 16, he won his brother and son back. Verse 16, got his wife back. Verse 16, he got it all together. Verse 17, man, someone visits him right off the bat. Very next verse, look at it. The king of Sodom went out to meet him as he returned. First one out there is the devil. And may I say this to you? When you have won or been blessed by something, you got to understand that's when the battle begins for your soul not for your goods. See, we always think if we got the goods, we win the battle. (laughs) It's not that way at all. It's if you got your soul, you win the battle. The value of your soul is what's this all about. Is anybody listening? So he comes out first one, 
comes out is the devil. You'll find when you have been blessed by God, first one's going to show up, try to lead you in the wrong direction. Try to get you to do something you shouldn't do or what you never would have done when you were in the battle. But now that you're not in the battle and you think you've won, you got the goods, hmm? now he's going to come along and say, you don't have to do that anymore. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Because he's really not after the goods. He's really after your soul. Is anybody listening? Including yours. Let me take you, if I may, it's very, very important for you to see this. But after he comes, Melchizedek comes right after him. Remember, the king of Sodom represents the devil. King Melchizedek represents the king of peace, Selam. That's where you get the city name, Jerusalem, peace. And here you find the king of peace, Melchizedek comes on the scene, very next verse, verse number 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. Can I just say something to you? The one that came first, Satan, wanted to disconnect him from God because he had the stuff. But the one that came second, the king of peace, wanted to reconnect him with God. Do you see the words up there? Not by coincidence. Bread and wine. What does bread and wine represent to us in the New Testament? Represents communion. Communion means an intimate connection with God. Jesus said it like this to his disciples at the Last Supper. He said, this, he breaks his bread, and he says, this is my body, take, eat, in remembrance of me. Then he says about the wine, he says, this is my blood, the covenant that seals the New Testament. Take, drink, in remembrance of me. It's a communion time of connection. One wanted to disconnect after the battle. One wanted to reconnect. The choice now is for Abraham. Is he going to partake in the bread and wine and reconnect to the one who has the ability to bless him? Or is he going to follow the material stuff of, if you will, of Satan, who doesn't really care about it? And the blessing is in the connection. In fact, let me make a statement to you like this. You'll find out it's so important. Everything starts with communion with God. Without a connection with God, an intimate, personal connection with God, did you know that every time we come to church, it's a communion service? Not maybe the bread physically, not maybe the wine physically, but man, our hearts are connected to the King of glory who is the blesser himself. And that's what this is all about. And we need to see how important this is he is now bringing the blessing to him, connecting him back with God. In verse number 19, he makes a statement which is really fascinating. He says, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram, the God of the most high, possessor of the heavens and the earth. And blessed be the God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Did you know that the blessing was twofold? One, you're connected with God. The other, you're covered by God. Isn't that what Jesus did when he came? He connected us back to God, and then he protects us in the future with God. Amen. And a lot of people don't understand this. The power of the blessing is so important for you to understand. In order for you to handle the blessing the right way, you've got to understand the power of the blessing. Let me give you an illustration. Dr. Becker, come on up here, if you will, just for a moment. If I said to Dr. Becker, I am going to bless you. I am going to prosper you. I am going to see that your family has generational blessings. Everything you put your hand to, you shall prosper. The doors are going to open to you. They're going to be wide and a variety of things are going to happen. I'm going to pour out the windows of heaven, blessings upon you. Can I tell you something? Those are cheap words because I don't have the ability to do any of it. 
There's no way I can do any of that. I can only say something in hopeful, wishful thinking for him. But when I say the God Almighty, notice this about Abraham. He is blessed because he was brought back in. The power of the blessing is not what I say. It's what God does. The blessing doesn't come from me. The blessing comes from God. Amen. So when I say God is going to bless you, God is going to open doors. God is going to establish your family. God is going to make a way where there is no way. God is going to do great, mighty, marvelous things. God is going to open a door so that everything you put your hand to, you'll prosper. All of a sudden now what I'm doing, I'm just affirming what God said because I don't have the ability to do it. Don't look to me to be the one that brings the blessing. The blessing has got to come from the one who can create a blessing and that's God. Thank you, doctor. Very important for us to see that. And Abraham recognizes that. In fact, right after he recognizes that, now he does something. The last part of verse 20, after he gets the connection back to God, in verse number, if you will, verse number 19, then in verse number 20, he makes this statement at the end of verse number 20. He says, and he gave him a tithe of all. Isn't that weird? All of a sudden, here's that word tithe again. In other words, if I got blessed, then I need to honor and respect the one who blessed me. Because remember this, remember this. The one who blessed me is greater than me. I'm the lesser He's the greater, so I take what I have and honor and respect him back. Amen. So here's Abraham that represents you. Here's the king of Sodom who represents the devil. And here's the king of Salem, Melchizedek, that represents Jesus. And there is a play for something. Let's see what it is. Let's go to the very next verse, verse number 21. In verse number 21, now the king of Sodom said to Abram, he's going to say something to him. Give me the persons, our people. One translation says souls. And you take the goods for yourself. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You take the goods for yourself? Where do the goods come from? Whose were they? Do you remember who captured them originally? They came from where? Sodom and Gomorrah. They were his goods. Notice how Satan, the devil, doesn't give a flip about material things. What he's after is the souls of men. Are you following me? This is all a battle to get you not to serve God with all of your heart by putting all kinds of obstacles in your way. Do you know, because he handled the blessings the right way, he was a prosperous man for the rest of his life. God prospered him. Amen. And wealthy as you can imagine. The real battles for your souls, including yours. He could have said, well, thank you so much, you know. Um, yeah, I'll take part of it and give you part. I gave him part, I'll give you part. Why not? compromise the whole thing and he would never have been blessed in the future but God could see that he could handle the right way the blessings and because he handled the blessings God gave him more blessings back yeah. is anybody listening to me because if you don't handle the blessings right don't expect to get more remember the birthday Christmas I mean kiss Christmas gift if you don't handle it the right way don't expect it to happen again and so what we're learning is immediately in the same verse, here it comes, he's after the souls. Abraham does something fascinating. He says this in verse 22, And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord. In other words, I've made a commitment to God. God most high, possessor of the heavens and the earth. There's none now there but him. He says, that I will not take anything. I will not even compromise. This is not important. Material things are not what I'm all about. Any material things I have won't come from you, Satan, but it'll come from God. 
And he makes his statement. He says this, I won't take anything, not a thread to a, stra- a sandal strap, that I will not take anything of yours. At least you should say that I have made Abraham rich. And then Abraham says in verse 24, the only things we'll take is that which these people have already taken and already eaten. In other words, last point for today. You absolutely cannot compromise in what you do. You're going to have to resist compromise. What I mean by that is you're going to try to think of ways that you can get by and go both the stuff and God. Get God and he'll give you the stuff. This is not what Matthew 6.33 says. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and then all these things will be added on to you. So seek God first. Is anybody listening? How you handle the blessing determines the future of blessings that God who loves you wants to bless you with. And there's an enemy trying to get you to compromise. You're going to have to resist the compromise. Today there's a lot of lessons to be learned in the scriptures. The most important is the handling of the blessing. Knowing that we're all going to be tempted by Satan, pushed by Satan. He doesn't care about your material stuff. So then why do we put such a store in it? He's not the one who gives us material stuff, but God is the one who prospered Abraham's hand. And I don't know about you, but I don't want it from Satan at all. He could go take a jump at a galloping ghost as far as I'm concerned. But I do want what God has. And that'll be a blessing by doing what God would have. Everything starts with connection. When you come to church, my friends, you have communion, you have connection with God. You can have a lousy week, be down, discouraged, get all kinds of junk in the mail. Satan himself sends you letters. But I'm here to tell you something. Guess what? When you come to church, you know someone has connected you back with God. You bring your tithe into the house of God. We take it and distribute it so it builds the kingdom of God. And that's how it works. And what you're saying by bringing your tithe is, God, I honor you who has blessed me. You say, well, I haven't gotten any money. You got a heart. Do the best you can. And build up until you get to the place where God would have you to give. And keep giving. Because the more you give, the more God will bless you back. Just like in the life of Abraham. God is so good to us. just want to take a moment. Man, like hundreds and hundreds of people got up and left. It's just so sad. Thank you for stay, staying seated. Those of you that respect and honor the Lord. And uh, I just want to encourage you. When you get up. Everybody follows you. Somehow we're kind of like sheep. (laughs) We follow everybody out. So someone gets up, oh, I guess I'll get up too. You know, I got to stretch or whatever. And the Holy Spirit's not finished. And so thank you for staying seated. And uh, we'll scold all the others that got up later. (laughs) But for now, I want to talk to those of you that are here. I want to ask you a question. I want you to evaluate the question and answer it in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. Is that okay? Nobody will know the answer to the question but you and God. But don't water this down and don't just stare at me. I want every one of you to answer the question. Here's the question. If you were to die in the next few minutes, bang, bomb, your heart stopped, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's what I'm asking. Would you go to heaven or hell? You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I don't believe in hell. Doesn't make it go away. Don't give a flip if you believe in it or not. Jesus believed in it. Therefore, it's real, and you're going to find out when the flames hit your butt. So let's just get past all of that, and let's talk about where you're really at. Is that okay? Are you going to heaven? If you died in the next few minutes, are you going to hell? You say, ooh, well, Pastor, I'm not sure. I hope I go to heaven. Well, I, I do too, but did you know you can't hope your way into heaven? Nowhere in the Bible says you can hope, hope, hope. Whoever's the greatest hoper gets to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Some of you said, well, Pastor, I'm a pretty good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. Did you know that nowhere again in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good? You're not going to make it. Some of you might have said to yourself, well, Pastor, uh, you know, my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. Uh, and, and, and they had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. They took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class 
when I was a child. Great, I'm glad they did that. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that'll take you to heaven, get you to heaven, because your mom and dad tell you those things that had you christened or baptized as a baby? You say, wait a minute, Pastor, I, 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 I always thought of myself as a Christian. Nowhere does it say positive thing, he'll get you to heaven. You're not going to make it. In order for you to get to heaven, now listen to what I'm going to say to you. Somebody right now needs to love you and respect you and honor you enough to tell you the truth and cut out all the bull. So let me tell you exactly how you're going to get to heaven according to the word of God. Not according to my feelings, some church committee, some traditional way, you're going to have to get there God's way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way. So you might as well listen up on how to get to heaven. Jesus said these words, John 3rd chapter. He says, you must be born again. Now when I use the word born again, everybody like freaks out because Hollywood has done a good job of portraying born again people like idiots and fools and uh, re radical nutball case cases. But that's not what he's talking about. Born again means something in the Bible. When he says you must be that, then he describes in the entire scripture what born again means. It means you've given God all of your heart, it means you've given God all of your life. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches that we've watered that down for 250 years in America. Because we're afraid of people by telling them the truth, they won't come back and give their money. That's a bunch of baloney. I am not afraid of you. I'm telling you exactly the truth. You've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. And when I say give, I mean it like this. Give means give. That doesn't mean he'll steal it from you. He's not a thief. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator. To manipul he gave you a free will choice. You can either choose him or not choose him. And you're going to have to choose Jesus and give him what he gave you. All of your heart and all of your life. That's exactly what he paid the price for you and gave you. And today, here you are in this safe, friendly place. I'll prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus said, I'm coming again. And when I find, come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just said? Lukewarm people who call themselves Christians... Listen to this. Listen, listen, listen. Lukewarm people that call themselves Christians are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus when he comes back. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, lukewarm. I'm not against God. No, no, you're not against him. But you're not wholehearted for him either. God is something in your life. Listen, that's lukewarm, but he's not everything. And that's the, that's the difference. And somebody needs to love you enough so that you can make the change and see the difference and respond God's ways the right way. Because without it, you're not going to make it. And somebody sees you as very important enough to tell you the truth. Today is your day of salvation. Today, God brought you here. You have a divine appointment with God. You say, well, how do I get right with God? You have to do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. You know what you're saying by the raising of your hand? Here's what you're saying. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'll see it. Why is that important? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you as mine before my father. But if you sit there and deny me, I'll deny you when the time comes. The time will come for every single one of you. Some are sooner than others. But today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three who should raise their hand. If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, my goodness, make sure. Even in the family rooms, in the foyer, wherever you're at, even online across the world right now, God's watching you right where you're at. Today is your day of salvation. 
I'm going to count to three, pop my Bible, and you get your hand up all over this place. Let me see it, and then put it right back down. How simple can that be? You say, well, that'll embarrass me. Yep, it's better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that stupid. But the devil thinks you are, and he's trying to talk you out of getting your hand up right now saying it's not important to you. You don't have to do it when you know you need to. I'm counting. I've done my job. I told you the truth all day. Today is your day. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. Eleven. Thank you. Twelve. Back here. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Thank you. Back over here. Sixteen. Thank you. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. To one. To two. To three. To four. To five. Thank you. Twenty-six. Thank you. Back over here. Anybody else? Twenty-six. Oh, oh, I see. All the heathens were sitting on that side today. I don't think so. Come on. Stop messing with me on this side. God, you know I, I'm talking to you. Get your hand up. There's twenty-six. Where are you? You know you need to get your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 26. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm going to cut this off and you're going to miss out again because you don't want to do what God would have you. 27. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Come on. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 27. Here's what I want you to do quick. All 27 of you. I want all 27 of you, raise your hand, you're serious about God. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Don't mess with me now. This is what you're going to have to do. Jesus walked a, a bloody mess through the streets for you. You can walk a safe aisle for him. Get your stuff. Get a friend. If you raised your hand or if you didn't raise your hand, you should have. I want you to get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Meet me in front. We need to pray and invite Jesus into our heart. You come right now. Come on. Come on. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. Come on. Give them a hand as they come. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Jesus, I belong. Coming, give them a hand. They're still coming, give them a hand. They're still coming. Jesus, I believe. Isn't God good? Best, the best decision you ever made in your entire life. You have just made. You're gonna be so happy. In a moment, I want to introduce you to a man by the name of Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe's a good guy. Listen to what, he's gonna do three things. He's gonna, these three things, I wanna tell you what they are so you don't you know, get weird on me and get afraid. Don't get afraid of anything. Here's the first one. He's gonna lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You gotta do that. There's no way I can pray over you and you get to heaven. You gotta invite Jesus into your own heart. I love these preachers. They'll say, oh, bless you, you're in heaven. That ain't gonna work. It just doesn't work that way. You have to invite him into your heart. He's a gentleman, won't come in unless you invite him. He'll lead you in a prayer. Number two, he's gonna give you free stuff to take home and read about. Now that you're a Christian, what to do next, you know? That's pretty cool. I mean, everybody, you know, now that I'm a Christian, what does God want me to do? Free stuff, is that okay? So the F word for San Bernardino is free. And, and so we just love it around this place. And so it's free. Third thing, He's going to introduce you to a program that we have that will help you get strong. Why? Because you don't want to go back falling through the cracks. We want you to be successful, get the blessings, keep the blessings going, not falling through the cracks, not going backwards, but going forward with God will help you. If you fall down, we'll pick you up and love you until you don't fall down anymore and you pick somebody else up and help you. So I'm telling you now, this is a great program we have that'll help you get strong in Jesus. So only takes a moment. People you came with, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow, if you will, Pastor Joe right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer. 
of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.